without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our very famous guest, uh, Gary Noy, a Sierra Nevada native and current resident. Gary Noy has taught history at Sierra Community College in Rockland, California from 1987 to present. The son and grandson of Cornish hard rock gold miners, Gary was born in Grass Valley, Nevada County, California. He is a graduate of UC Berkeley and CSU Sacramento. In 2006, the Oregon California Trails Association, a national historical society, selected Gary as Educator of the Year. Gary is the author of Distant Horizon, Documents from the 19th Century American West, co-editor with Rick Heidi of The Illuminated Nans Landscape, a Sierra Nevada anthology, the award-winning Sierra Stories, Tales of Dreamers, Schemers, Bigots, and Rogues, and Gold Rush Stories, 49 Tales of Seekers, Scoundrels, Loss, and Luck. His newest book is Hellacious California, Tales of Rascality, Revelry, Dissipation, Depravity, and The Birth of the Golden State. Welcome, Gary. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Please so take appreciate your seats, please. <laughs> <laughs> we can do the big crowd. Oh, oh, no. oh no. Yes. not necessary. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. And let me add to that because it, it's new since I sent you this biography. Just a couple of weeks ago, I signed a contract for a new book, the University of Nebraska. It's an anthology on 19th century Yosemite. And the title, the working title is Nature's Mountain Mansion, which is a part of a quote from John Muir. Nature's Mountain Mansion, an anthology of wonder, wrangles, bloodshed and belly aching in 19th century Yosemite. And so it's an examination of much like Hellacious California in which there's this romantic vision of Yosemite and then there's the reality. And there were a lot of people who did not like the experience going to Yosemite in the 19th century. And it, it, it delves into that a little bit, some of the unknown history. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, uh, to talk for the uh, Sierra College Press. And uh, since this is being recorded, I'm sure it's going to be spread worldwide, especially to those German people. Absolutely, earlier. primarily to the yeah, German primarily. people. So if you'd like, I could just uh, talk a little bit about how the book came about and why it's titled Hellacious California, because there's a specific reason for that. Um, this book came about because as you mentioned in the introduction, I've done uh, a number of other books on the West. Let me do a little show and tell here. This is my first book, Distant Horizon, which was on the American West. My new pu my publisher, my new book is University of Nebraska. This is University of Nebraska. This is 23 years ago. I was 11 when I did this. And then there was Illuminated Landscape, which is the first trade paperback that Sierra College Press ever did, which is on uh, Anthology of the Sierra Nevada. Sierra Stories, which is unusual stories of the, uh, of the Sierra Nevada. And this is what, Lisa, we did uh, videos on. Was this? Yeah, I remember. Gold Rush Stories, which is stories about the California Gold Rush. And this new book that's coming up too. And then there's Hellacious California, this book, which is what I want to talk about. And the reason I mention all these other books is that as I was putting them together, I found something common, a common denominator in all of them. And that is whatever the historical event, whatever the person that I was talking about, 99% of the time, they were involved in a vice when they were doing something. They were drinking or gambling or fighting or smoking or eating too much or being taken by con artists or whatever it may be. That was the common denominator. And so for this book, Hellacious California, I said, why not focus on the vices if they're that important? Let's take a look at all of these, these various things uh, that, that motivated and influenced people so much. And so that's what, that's what the book uh, deals with. And it was called, it is called Hellacious California because the word hellacious has two meanings. It depends on how it's used. Hellacious can mean something terrible and that's the way it's most commonly used. For instance, if there's a horrible hailstorm, you say that was a hellacious hailstorm. But it can also be used to mean something astonishing and wondrous. The same hailstorm, the beauty and the power of nature 
can be considered hellacious. So hellacious hailstorm could be so bad or it could be a wonderful, wondrous event. It's like, um, it's like the word, I don't know if they do this anymore, but like the word bad, that people when you say that's, that's a bad man, it could mean a terrible person or it could be somebody that's really strong and impressive. And so that's what California was in the 19th century. It was hellacious. There were things about it that were astonishing, but there were also things that were frightening and horrible. And that was the theme I was trying to get across in this book is to focus on these vices and to show a little bit about how it was viewed as kind of a, a rollicking uh, a reflection of California's youth or something but also that it was horrifying at times and uh, destructive. And so that was the theme uh, behind the book. This look at California uh, looks at the fact that in the 19th century, particularly the period I, I deal with from 1821 to 1900, when California becomes, uh, when Mexico gains its independence from Spain in 1821, that California becomes a unique, uh, separate culture from the Mexican culture. It's Alta California, Northern California. And through the 1900s, California goes from being a Spanish colony to a Mexican province, to a military governorship, to a self-governing dominion, to statehood, all within about 20 years. And there's huge changes economically, socially, culturally, you name it, in, uh, in California. And with all of that turmoil, there comes all of these changes, huge population increase. The population of California increases 1,500% in one year during the gold rush. It becomes the most ethnically and culturally, socially diverse place on earth during the California gold rush. And it remains in those that that really that situation today. So a lot of what we see in California today has its precursors in the 19th century, both good and bad, uh, both sublime and evil come from this California 19th century. And that's what I tried to focus on by using uh, the vices as a way of uh, approaching this. I think one of the things that I found fascinating about the book, I mean, I found multiple things fascinating in the book, but that, that that very thing that you're just mentioning is the culture of California, because we see that in, in our world today. When you hear people talk about the state of California, people who are not from the state of California in particular, about our different culture, like California is an entity in and of itself. And I don't think, I, I think I thought of that as more of a modern thing versus something that came from the past. Even though I understood that the gold rush brought in people from all over the world and people from all over the country, and it was a diverse place then, I don't think I really had an understanding of the foundations of California's culture until I started to read the book. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I, I think you're correct. All of these different cultures came in. Uh, and it started during the California period too, as there started to be beyond the, the Mexican Californian society, there started to be the American traders coming into Monterey, bringing in their values as well. And all of this influx of people, particularly during the gold rush period, uh, brought in all these different cultural attributes and behaviors. But I think the most important import was attitude and that the people who came to California brought with them this idea that this is a place where you can reinvent yourself, where you can start over, where you can fail, and there's very little fallout from it, and you can experiment. And that whole idea of California being on the cutting edge of societal change is not a 20th century thing. It's a 19th century thing. And it just spilled over into the 20th century and continued to grow. Uh, I mean, the roots of the motion picture industry being in California or Silicon Valley or agricultural developments are 19th century origin. 
and uh, and that's what I tried to uh, uh, to express and to focus on uh, in this book is that there are extraordinary things that happen, but with it came these these very dark elements too, and the attitudes that were imported also included racism and misogyny and and uh, and uh, disrespect for different cultural values. It's a mix. It's a very curious mix during this time period. If I can give you an example, I'll give you an example of a hellacious thing. Uh, I recount this in the book and it goes to, since this is a writer's conference, it goes a little bit into what storytelling, how storytelling can, uh, can influence historical writing. Two of the most um, popular entertainments during the 19th century in California was something called pedestrianism, and the other was animal exhi exhibitions, private animal exhibitions. And pedestrianism was essentially marathon race walking, in which there you'd walk for 100 hours straight with no break, and whoever survived basically won the race. So this was very popular. It was more popular than baseball. Uh, people who were involved in this, there were biographies written about them. There were trading cards for pedestrians. And then the animal exhibitions, uh, zoos were really not part of the mix yet. They were private. And there were animal exhibitions, the most famous of which was something called the Mountaineers Museum in San Francisco. It was run by a Massachusetts shoemaker who came to California to start his life over. His name was John Capon Adams, but he's better known as Grizzly Adams. And he had a private animal exhibition. He had a grizzly bear and mountain lions and bobcats and, and uh, you name it. He had all these wild animals that people paid a fee in order to, uh, to come see. Well, that's two of the eccentric uh, entertainments. And if I was teaching a history class, I could just say that in a lecture. That's not interesting just by itself. But if you make it in a story, the story becomes, uh, I think, more uh, meaningful and, and something you remember more. So here's the story. There came a point where the most famous pedestrian in California was a guy named James Kennevin, Uncle Jimmy Kennevin, he called himself. And he made his living by doing these marathon race walking. And he did dozens of them a year. But he's fallen upon hard times. And so he wanted to promote himself. So he lived in San Francisco and he went to the Mountaineer Museum, which is in San Francisco. And he went to Grizzly Adams. And he said, you know, there's a way I can promote myself and your museum. And Grizzly Adams said, okay, well, tell me what you have in mind. And Kenavan, Uncle Jimmy said, I want you to put me in a cage on a wagon with a live grizzly bear and a mountain lion. No separation, just put them in the cage and then parade us up and around the streets of San Francisco. I can promote myself as a pedestrian and I can promote your Mountaineer Museum. And Grizzly Adams agreed to this. So Kenavan was put in this, this cage, he was terrified. They paraded it around, rolled it around the streets of San Francisco for a couple of hours. And they came back to the Mountaineer Museum and Kenavan was okay. He hadn't been touched and he was greatly relieved. And so he gets out of the wagon, out of the cage. And the handler of the grizzly bear comes over to remove the grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear attacks that man and rips off his arm. That's a little bit more interesting, I think, than just saying the two most... In, two eccentric entertainments were pedestrianism and animal exhibitions. That's the power of storytelling. And it applies to anything across the genres, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or poetry. The key to getting the writer's interest, in my humble opinion, is to make it into a story. There's a reason why the last five letters of the word history are S-T-O-R-Y. Make it a story. So that's what I tried to do as well uh, in this book. I think it's important. You talk a little bit about like how the narrative is handled. In my own 
historical research. I read like a lot of newspapers and the perspectives that you get in there, are, you know, usually like from the white man's perspective. And it's, it's definitely hard. And when you're dealing with the 19th century, um, a lot of times in the past, the historical narrative has focused on the white male perspective because the historians are white males and they grew up in a, in a society in which that was the dominant group. That's changed, thank God, that's changed in recent years. But finding different perspectives uh, can be difficult. It's there. There's a lot of material that has never been transcribed. I know for a fact, because I did a lot of research there, the California State Library has thousands of letters and journals that have never been transcribed from the 19th century because it's just so expensive uh, to do it. And a lot of those journals were ignored in the past because they came from women or from people of color. And it provides an entirely different perspective on things. I include this in my book. Uh, there was a book written about prostitution in the last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, is it was a series of newspaper articles by a woman who was identified by the name Alice. And it led to uh, a, a book ultimately that came about this in which Alice recounted her story of being a prostitute, being forced into prostitution because uh, her family just abandoned her. And so it's very detailed. It is not uh, the, the romantic lonesome dove kind of prostitute viewpoint. And it spurred hundreds of letters from people who were reading the newspaper articles from prostitutes who spelled out in great detail exactly what their life was like and how brutal it was. That didn't come to light until the 20th century. Even though the articles were published in the 19th century, they were not dealt with seriously until the 20th century. And so one of the things about historical scholarship that's good in the last 25 years or so is the different perspectives are being considered and the research is being done to find that stuff. And you find the details are there. You just have to dig. It's like searching for gold, really. Well, okay, I'm curious if you have like background information about the California state history, because over the pandemic, the Smithsonian was doing crowdsourcing for transcribing those old documents. And I just recently saw on Ancestry, they did a big you know, promotion thing about how the Freemans Bureau documents are now available on Ancestry. And that was something I was helping with over the pandemic. And I would love to see stuff like those letters from the California State Library get crowdsourced that way too. Well, yeah, I asked because particularly when I did my, my Gold Rush uh, book, um, I asked because I'm, I'm pretty tight with some of the people at the State Library. And I had access to some of these letters and I used some of them in my book. And I said, what's the deal here? And it was, it was simply funding. There, the State Library went through a series of significant cuts in their funding and they lost personnel and the whole thing. They have the equipment. They can do it, but they just don't have the personnel to do it. So I'm hoping that that's going to turn around now that the economy appears to be picking up, uh, that they can do this. One thing they have done, and state library is great. And the Library of Congress has been unreal. They're so good at this, at digitizing uh, historical documents. You're talking about the Freedmen's Bureau stuff yeah, uh, as well. And the, gosh, in the last 20 years, it's been enormous. And I was fortunate for the Hellacious California book that the Library of Congress has an extraordinary searchable resource of digitized books from the 19th century California literature. That's great. When I did my first book, but 23 years ago, that none of that existed. Right. You had to go digging for it. And you still have to dig for it, but they made it a little bit easier. So uh, the resources are there. It's Historical scholarship can be very, very frustrating, but there are some tools now that, that make it a little bit more pleasurable. What were some of the stories you uncovered that were kind of like aha moments for you? For this book? Yeah. Uh, I think the thing that surprised me the most 
was the chapter I did on tobacco. And I knew tobacco was always there. And when I did the Gold Rush book, everybody was chewing or smoking or spitting tobacco. But I didn't realize how ubiquitous it was. I didn't know, for instance, <clears throat> excuse me. I didn't know, for instance, that the first newspaper published in the state of California was published on tobacco wrapping paper because that was the most common paper that was available. I didn't know, for instance, that the biggest industry in San Francisco in 1880 was cigar rolling. Okay. They produced 9 million cigars a month for 20 years. That there were cigar stores everywhere. They're like Starbucks. There were cigar stores everywhere. And people from children to the elderly all smoked. It was generally viewed as a healthy thing. There were instances of Catholic masses that were stopped in the middle of the mass so, so the congregation could go out and smoke. I mean, that was, that was the thing, I think of everything, the thing that surprised me. And I came across the chapter ends with the story of a dog in Sonora by the name of Scout. Sport was his name. Sport was his name. That became hopelessly addicted to chewing tobacco and became so famous for doing tricks on his own in order to get chewing tobacco that a major um, empresario of, uh, of the theater offered to pay $5,000 for sport to go on the stage. $5,000 in 1890 would be the equivalent of about $200,000 today. And so that was a surprise to me. There were lots of surprises of, of things that I had kind of an inkling about, but the tobacco thing was really a surprise uh, to me. To go back to um, talking about the primary documents that you have, that you've had to dig for in the California State Library, First off, where do you dig? What part of the California State Library do you do that in? And secondly, you mentioned these letters by prostitutes that have that are all hidden away. And what did you find in those uh, letters that you might be able to share with um, people who maybe haven't read your book or sure. something that's not in the book? Uh, the California State Library part there is a, a section, a separate section in the California State Library called the California History Section. And it actually has a separate entrance. And it's where if you have anything to do with California history, that's where you go. And it's has all the microfilms of basically all the newspapers ever published in California. It has a huge, extensive um, uh, stacks arrangement. It's where... The Holy of Holies of the State Library is located the vault, which has cool stuff. The only photograph of John Sutter's there. Uh, it has a, a Gutenberg Bible. It has all of these really cool things. And I was fortunate enough to go there a couple of times. Uh, all of this is available to you. The, uh, the uh, employees, the staff there are, I've, I've done research at the Library of Congress and the National Archives as well. They do not compare to the State Library uh, staff. They are amazing. They will take you by the hand uh, to find this stuff, and they know where everything's located. Now, as for the letters you were talking about, these letters, this was a series of newspaper articles written back in the 1890s, and the letters were published, most of them. However, uh, there was an outcry from the community that wanted to suppress this. And so while they were published, they were not widely disseminated. Uh, there were groups that fought against this knowledge being put out there. So they ended up being kind of shelved. And then it came back in the mid 1970s or so that there started to be research about these letters. And when newspapers started to be digitized and were searchable, there's a, a resource called the California Digital Newspaper Collection, which is fabulous. You could find them again. You could find the originals. And in these letters, all of the romantic myths 
about prostitution were dispelled. And they went into, the women went into the violence. They went into why they became prostitutes. It wasn't a sexual thing. It was economics that they were dismissed by their family or they were poor or they had their husband had died or they had to support their children and there were no other jobs available. It got down to the real details of why women became prostitutes and how they were brutalized, that there was nothing romantic about it. It was brutal. And how these women were treated was detailed in incredible detail. And it's, it's a remarkable series of letters and I'm glad they resurfaced, uh, but they were, they were there originally, but the community overwhelmingly found this to be uh, distasteful and they didn't want anything to do with it at the time. So uh, this is the kind of thing you find. So what would you search for on the digital newspaper collection to find those? Well, what's great about this, this resource I should mention it goes newspapers in California all the way back to the 1820s in Spanish language all the way up to today. And they have a search thing and you just put in prostitution and it'll bring up every article of every newspaper that mentions prostitution. And you can sort them by date. You can sort them by uh, publication. Uh, it's extraordinary, and usually thousands of things come up. So the search, you have to be much more specific. If you went in and say, prostitution Alice, because that was the name of the woman in, the, in this thing, you'll find it. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just like anything else. We all know about Google searches and stuff. The more specific you are, the, the more refined you can make your, your searches, but the resources are that, there. And the Library of Congress, has this extraordinary collection called California as I saw it, California in the 19th century. The, all these books, it's not newspapers, it's hard copy, you know, books. Totally searchable. And when I did this hellacious thing, uh, I went into this book and I put in tobacco. And there were hundreds of books that came up that included some of the things I've told you about tobacco that I never had a clue about that are just sitting there in plain sight. You just have to make the effort. And if you do, you can find some real nuggets. It's just amazing uh, what's out there. In the California Digital Newspaper Collection, I entered tobacco, and that's where I got this story about sport, which was illustrated by photographs, which was very unique back in the 1890s in the newspaper. So the stuff's there and you find it across the board with all of these these vices that i talked about uh, uh, the information's there it just was, had never been really addressed and so that's that's what made it kind of exciting for me i just want to maybe tack on to what gary just said just to get him to clarify that a little bit because i know as a composition teacher i'm hoping that students will watch this why is so Google is a great tool, but what tell you know what is the difference between looking at some kind of Google source versus going to like California State Library or this digital resource? Just so students can hear that. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I deal with this all the time in my history classes too. That if you're going to use historical resources, Google search can point you in the direction. But unless you see the original document as a PDF or the state library as the, the original hard copy document, you got to be wary. Uh, there are reliable sources and there are not. And in all of the sources I've talked to, the Library of Congress and so forth, it's usually a dual presentation. They have a transcription and then they have the original. And you find the same thing. Uh, Another really good resource is the Hathi Trust, if you know what the Hathi Trust is. It's a, a, a privately funded collection of, gosh, millions of books and, and journal articles for decades, reaching back in the 1800s, uh, that are essentially just PDF, they're just pictures of the original documents. And it's also searchable, uh, great resource. And so, you have to be careful. A friend of mine 
uh, Gary Kurtz, who wrote a foreword for one of my books, was the, the chief, was the head, the director of the California History Section at the State Library. And he's written a number of bibliographies of historical events in California. He has a hard and fast rule that he will not include anything in his book, in any of his books, unless he sees the original document it will, it will never be a transcription. The transcription may be 100% accurate, but unless he sees the original sources of PDF or JPEG or the actual document, he will not use it. And I have used, I have used that philosophy in the, the books I use too, that unless you see it, you can't necessarily believe it. And so uh, I've, I've kept that as a rule in what I do. And I'm glad I do, because sometimes it leads you to stuff that's never been transcribed and uh, it's not online, but gosh, it's cool when you find it. Say, I presume that when you're out there hunting for whatever it is you're focused on, that you inevitably find what's going to be your next book topic in, in things you didn't expect to find. Well, that's what led to this Yosemite book Yeah, that I'm doing, that I'm doing because as I started looking in the Hellacious California book about hotels and dining and, and drinking and traveling, it kept popping up these stories of people who went to Yosemite and there's this dichotomy of how they see things. They're overwhelmed by the beauty, like we all are when we go to Yosemite, but there's a lot of bitching about the food and the accommodations and the smell and the fact that through the 1870s, the last 20 miles to Yosemite Valley, you had to do it on horseback. They didn't tell them that. And so as a result, there's a lot of complaining. And so you get, and I included these in the anthology that I'm putting together, these people that say, I'm overwhelmed by the beauty, but gosh, it smells bad here. But gee, the food is terrible. And how come I'm paying so much money for a watered down drink? It's like tourists today. I mean, it's the same kind of thing you get, but I didn't expect that. That was kind of surprising to me. I figured everybody just loved the Yosemite experience, but they did not. Hmm. And so uh, that's kind of the theme of the new book I'm doing. So. so kind of tied to that and also tied to our conversation that we were having before our your presentation uh, workshop began, about romanticism, not not with the capital R, but the lowercase version, uh, nostalgia for the American West, nostalgia for the gold rush, that sort of thing. Um, you do address that by, you know, peeling back the layers of what really happened. And one of the things that the book talks about is the near starvation level that um, miners lived at, and that sort of thing. I didn't don't know if you want to address you know, maybe our popular conception of our present conception of the gold rush and, you know, that it was some kind of golden era, wonderful times versus what the actual gold rush was like. Sure, I'm happy to do that. And as, as we were talking about before, since I come from a mining family and my dad and grandpa both worked at the Empire Mine in Grass Valley, um, my grandpa was a miner for 50 years all over the West including in Deadwood, South Dakota. He knew Calamity Jane. The, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the stories. I know what the lifestyle is uh, for miners. And what you get, in particular, when it comes to the California gold rush, is you get, as I mentioned to you before, what I call the paint your wagon syndrome. That, like the paint your wagon musical, where everything was kind of comical and, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody was lively and it was a grand adventure. It wasn't. Most people failed. There was much violence. The lifestyle of the miners was dangerous. The two most dangerous groups in America in uh, the 19th century, working on the railroad and working in a mine. And so it was dangerous. It was low paid, but there was at the same, this is kind of the, whole, the hellacious formula. It was terrible, but it was also something that the miners were very proud of. My grandpa was incredibly proud of his skill as a miner. 
even though it was dangerous, even though he lost his hearing ultimately from working around mining machinery, he was very proud of his skill. And there's this mix of this, that there's this romantic element that kind of blocks, puts into shadow what the reality was. But I think in a kind of curious way, the reality of the miner's experience makes them even more admirable because despite the difficulties they faced, they were incredibly proud and uh, to, to great, um, it was important to them to let everyone know that what they did was skillful. It just wasn't hard labor. It was something that only somebody with experience could do. And I think you find that with the cowboy culture, you find that uh, uh, in the native cultures, you find that in, in the business community, it becomes particularly accentuated in California where everything is so intense during the 19th century, but it's all there and it, it's a, a mix. But if you're looking at the perspective of American Western history, purely from a romantic perspective, you're missing a lot because you're missing what the reality was and how these people overcame that in order to, uh, to gain great personal power in the in belief in what they did. Okay, I'll tie it into like the theme we're gonna do for the conference in February. Um, there's a big controversy going on about reopening the Idaho Maryland mines locally. And when I read the comments for editorials in the paper, you know, there's lots of different points of view about, you know, who to support. And I've noticed that it seems like we do repeat history. And so back when we had our miners here, I was reading in our papers about how the mine owners, you know, they had these very lavish mansions in San Francisco. And then we had things going on with the workers here and the business people, you know, which side they took. Can you talk to that, about that a little bit? Well, yeah, and I, I should mention that both my grandpa and my dad worked at the Idaho, Maryland. Right over there is a photograph of my dad coming out of the, uh, the skip, the, the mine conveyance, you know, uh, out of the hoist at the Idaho, Maryland when he was a young man. So that's a personal thing to me. And I've been following that a little bit too about reopening Yes, they talked about doing that with the Brunswick mine too. And they've actually talked about it with the Empire mine at, at points. Um, it's very expensive. And you end up with the, uh, the same kind of tension that was, was there during the mining period. There was always tension uh, between the owners and, uh, and the miners. One of the first groups in America to be unionized was the miners. And so... Uh, there's always been that tension and I, I'm certain it's going to happen again. I mean, this is expensive enterprise and the people who put the money into it want return on their investment. How is that going to play out with the miners? What kind of safety issues, what kind of pay are they going to get? I mean, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's the case, but I can guarantee you uh, that whoever's going to do that mining, they're going to be really proud of what they do because it is a skill. It's not just digging in rock. It's knowing where to dig and how to dig. And it's, it's something I have great admiration for. I have a two part question. One going back to the romantic view of the West. And um, so you kind of talk about how Miners were very proud, and we don't necessarily get that picture via um, our romantic vision of the West and of mining. But also, do you think that there's a darker side that we've missed out on because of that romantic view? And then second, I think this book personally for me, as I've expressed before, but maybe this is just a slightly different take on it, is how relevant what was happening in the past is... <laughs> really still happening today. And so if you could talk about how the past is prologue, that would be really lovely. I'd be happy to do that. Let me address the first part. Uh, first, there is a truism in history, historical scholarship, that the, the victors write the histories. 
And so the workers, the working class are the people who do the work, but they're not the ones who take the credit. And the credit goes to the powerful and the powerful get to write the histories and they get to suppress the histories if they don't like it. And so the reality of what happened is the same issue with happened with the prostitution that I was talking about earlier. Uh, the reality is often hidden and it usually takes a long time, usually a generation or more uh, when people are divorced from the actual experience before these things start to resurface. And uh, that's, you know, that's part of the revisionist part of, uh, of history as you, you revisit it. But at the time, it's the heroic nature of it. And it's usually the people who are in charge who, uh, who get all the credits, like the people who built the railroad. It wasn't the Chinese who got the credit, even though they were 90% of the workforce on the Central Pacific. It was Stanford and people like that. Now, the other part of the question about uh, parallels with today, can I give you a couple of quick examples? In 1852, is a presidential election year. And when that election took place in Sacramento, when the election results came out, Millard Fil Millard Fillmore won the election. When the presidential election results came out, there was a group in Sacramento that said that the presidential election was rigged and that it was influenced by outside influence, possibly the Russians, because it, Sacramento had significant trading relationships with the Russians. Does this sound familiar? It led to a riot. 60 people died. 3,000 buildings were destroyed in Sacramento in a fire. Over a billion dollars in property damage because the belief that the election was rigged. That's one. The other that we're living through right now is the pandemic, of course. In 1850, there was a cholera epidemic that swept through California. It was part of a 30 year pandemic around the world and it reached California in 1850. When it came to California, it ended up killing about 12% of the population. And the population by the, the best estimate is about 100,000 people. So we're talking about, you know, 12%. If we had the percentage of California today, die that did in that epidemic, there would be 400,000 dead people. But the fascinating part to me, and this is the one regret I have about Hellacious California, is that it takes about two years to do a book thing. Literally on the day that I got the galley proofs, I'm, I'm dating myself here, I don't do galley proofs anymore. They do a printout of what the book looks like, a PDF. And literally on the day I got the the printout was the day we went into lockdown for COVID. And so I didn't have an opportunity to address in the hellacious California disease and epidemics. I wish I had that opportunity uh, to do it now because I did some research after the book came out and I looked at the Sacramento Union newspaper, which was the major newspaper in Sacramento at the time. And I read these articles and it talked about the cholera epidemic and it was, it was in November when it hit. And you look at the newspaper in October and it says the cholera epidemic has come to San Francisco, but it's so far away, it won't affect us. And then a few days later, oh, it's reached into the Delta, but it's so far, it won't get to us. And then it's in Sutterville, right outside of Sacramento, a few days later. And then it hits Sacramento. And then for a month, the Sacramento Union through on its front pages and other pages, lists the dead that have died from the epidemic that day. And every one of them says cholera. And at the same time, the newspapers also are filled with advertisements for bogus cures. Same thing we're kind of going through now. And the most famous of these cures was, the, was something called Sacramento Strait. Cholera is a waterborne disease. And so entrepreneurs said that the way you can cure cholera is by drinking water directly from the river, Sacramento River, because it's pure. So they sold river water, river water, 
that was the carrier medium for cholera to people as a cure and it just spread the disease. So there are parallels, definite parallels. Uh, during There's also stuff about racial reckoning during the, the 1850s that is very profound. It led ultimately to 15% of the black population of California leaving the state and going to British Columbia. All of this has parallels with today. History can be very instructive. And uh, you, can, you can see how people reacted at the time. And we look at how we react today and we'd like to think we've come a long ways, but sometimes we haven't even made another step in the right direction. So uh, there's a lot of parallels. It's too bad we don't understand, um, I don't know. Uh, this is a, more of a psychology question than a history question. Why don't we change? Why can't we learn from our mistakes? Gosh, that's the eternal question. I think philosophers have been thinking about this since, you know, Socrates. And uh, I don't know if we're any closer to it. Um, you know, there's, there's all these, these tools to address these things uh, today. And the information highway, superhighway, there's a lot of material out there. But mm -hmm. is it reliable? And is it something you can you can trust to point you in the right direction? And a lot of the information we see today is, is just noise and it's not really reliable and it just becomes, uh, becomes really difficult. Yeah, I would say that the vectors for um, diseases and for misinformation have become much faster, right? So if we look, oh, yeah. that's, the one, that's the one change. It took a lot longer for cholera to get to Sacramento than it took for COVID to get to Sacramento. I don't know. I kind of think they're the same too, actually, because some of the old newspapers, I just was look, reading old, these old phone directories and like in the very front of the phone directory, it had like, this is what happened like every single day. It was like reading a Twitter feed. You know, one of them was, uh oh, looks like we're getting smallpox breaking out. This is in San Francisco. And I'm like, smallpox, you know? <laughs> well, it's- But, it's, but it's, I mean, it was like the newspapers are like, who's partying? You know, it's like, it was like the Twitter of yesterday. Well, it's, it's like, I, I talked about this in the book too, that um, a very common cure for alcoholism was a whole series of potions, kind of over the counter, you know, snake oil kind of stuff. Every one of them, every one of these cures for alcoholism that you took, all of them had significant percentages of alcohol. Right. Yeah. They were actually more alcoholic than the alcoholic beverages. And another one, this was a cure for, uh, found this for tobacco. A cure for tobacco was what was called the light bath, in which this is a time, 1870s, when the electric light bulb was now showing up, that you would sit in this cabinet with incandescent bulbs, very bright incandescent bulbs, and you would go through sun. It's like a tanning bed, only it was, it was supposed to be medicinal. And the way it was advertised was that the light, people didn't understand electricity yet so much, that the electricity and the light would go into your body and kill all of the bad stuff. And theoretically, they argued, you could live forever. Huh. And it was very popular for a while until they figured out it was, you know, charlatans were running it. Well, okay, so here's our theme. This is why stories matter. It matters on both sides for... <laughs> Evil. <laughs> stories are good and stories can be bad yeah it's like uh i'm sure you, you maybe you teach this uh when that there's a story by that i love by ursula Le Guin, and it's the ones who walk away from omelas oh, yes Omelas. yes i have the i have taught it it's, english 1b that's the and, story, that's that's what stories should do it should be interesting. I'll repeat it, you guys, because I'm not familiar with it. You want to do this, Claire? Sure. I can give you kind of a, an overview without ruining the story, I hope. Um, it's told from an interesting point of view. So it's very distant, um, told in like third person point of view, uh, uh, omniscient. 
about this very great culture of people and how they have their large city and they have these beautiful parades and flags and everything is wonderful. It is the ideal society. And then the narrative shifts to second person and we find out not to, so I don't wanna give a spoiler because people should go read the story. We find out something very dark about this culture that enables them to have this very surface level presentation where they can all feel good about themselves because this one very dark and horrible thing exists. Very and dark. so I highly recommend that everyone read it. So behind every ideal society, it's all false because there is some level of darkness beneath. And the, the power of the story is after the story ends, because then you have to make a decision. What would you do in that situation? How would you respond to this horrifying situation? Will you be one of the people who walk away or not? And it's, it's very powerful. I love that kind of stuff. There's another thing that this is kind of apropos to it. There's an exercise called the six word story. I don't know if you know this. Yes, Hemingway's example. Hemingway's Hemingway the famous example. And yeah. the whole story is for sale, baby shoes, never worn. That's economy of writing to begin with, but it's so powerful. And the power of stories uh, are, are so amazing. And the best history writing are the ones that tell history or tell stories. That it's not just some linear chronological thing, very clinical but which, which delve into what all of this means and the, the texture of everything. That's what, that's what makes it extra fascinating to me. And I think to most people who read, uh, who yeah. like to read history. Well, I would say that Hellacious California is very good at storytelling. It is an engaging read. I mean, it is gripping. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> I think Gary Noy is an engaging storyteller. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I thought I would tell you a story that's not in the book. Sure. It gives a kind of a, a sense of this whole hellacious aspect of California, astonishing and, and horrifying at the same time. And for this, we have to hop in the time machine and we go back to 1897 and an article appears in the San Francisco Examiner by a man named Isaac Coggin. And the name today, Isaac Coggin, means nothing to anybody. But at the time, he was a very prominent figure. And you may have been to the place he's responsible for. In the middle of Golden Gate Park, there's a band shell where they do the outside concerts. He was the, the manager of the Golden Gate Park band in the 1890s. And he's responsible for that building being built. So he was a prominent social leader. But in this story, he recounts when he was a young man and he just came to California in 1860s and he was working at Lake Tahoe as an agricultural laborer and he has a day off and he decides to go along the shoreline of Lake Tahoe with his favorite dog and they're going to go hunting and he's walking along the shoreline of Lake Tahoe when all of a sudden his dog stops and sniffs and starts running. And Coggin doesn't find his dog for three days. And when he finds it, it's cowering under the porch of a cabin. And then Coggin find, quickly finds out why the dog is frightened because he looks up the hillside and something is crashing through the forest and it's knocking down trees and boulders of the size of a ton are being pushed out of the way. And there's this huge rumbling noise and he doesn't know if it's an earthquake or a landslide or what. And he's terrified. So he decides to crawl up in a tree so he can, he figures it'd be safer and he can see better. He crawls 20 feet up in a pine tree. And then out of the woods comes what's causing this commotion. This huge creature, says Coggin, rumbles out of the forest. And it's a, it has a black top and humps and a yellow belly and a long neck with a head on top of it. 
and it's rumbling and slithering, knocking these trees down. And the thing passes by him on the tree. Remember, he's 20 feet up in the tree. The head of this thing on top of his neck is five feet above him. And he says the eyes are as big as a serving platter. And the neck is 30 feet long. And the body is 20 feet wide, jet black, and rumbling and destroying everything in its path. And it goes down into the lake and swims out in the lake and then disappears under the lake. And he swears it's true. He swears there's eyewitnesses. This is a very respected person who has told this story. And we look at it today and we go, this guy is nuts. He must have been high or something. But this is a time period when there were still people, it's 1897, there were still people in America who did not believe Yosemite Valley existed. These are people who are just a few years before in 1893, a giant sequoia tree was cut down, hollowed out and used as a display at the Chicago World's Fair because nobody believed there were trees that big. So maybe this Tahoe Tessie did exist. This is the kind of thing that I think makes California hellacious. That's astonishing. It is it's astonishing. Not true, I don't think. Who knows? But that's the kind of thing people believe. That's what motivated folks. That's, mm -hmm. that's what makes this time period just so fascinating to me, how people reacted to what they saw or perceived. Things that we take for granted now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a wonderful story. We have changed. <laughs> it was a good story. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good story. Absolutely. One to, uh, that was a lovely wrap up to a great hour of listening to your wisdom and information about your writing. And I really, really enjoyed it, Gary. Thank you. Me too. Thank Me you too. to those of you out there who, uh, who showed up. I appreciate it. And our uh, silent partners. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And Lisa, it's great to see you again. Same. Um, thank you again so much. To buy a dozen of these. Yes. The Christmas present. Great I, I actually uh -huh. had an idea, Gary. I think we should bundle your books together and we'll call them the um, Gary Noy gift pack for Christmas. Yeah. I like, I like now. the alliteration. <laughs> right. So we can we can tie them together, right? With some Sierra stories and uh, hellacious California, and get them all in a with a bow, and people can give them away for Christmas. Hey, yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, we need to order work. them now so you have them by Christmas. <laughs> we we may I think we have some still in at Sierra College that we could do this. So yeah, I'm hoping sometime when all this COVID stuff is down, we can uh, we can have an actual book signing. I think that would be lovely. We'll plan never, for that. Never had a book yeah. launch for this no. because of uh, COVID. I'd love to have that. So We will plan for that for spring, Gary, for sure. Sounds great. All right. Thank you again so much. You are amazing. And I so appreciate um, your time and being here, that you, you were here. So. My pleasure. Yes. <laughs>